Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News, where we discuss the important events that would have taken place in Guyana over the past week or so. And as I would normally say, there always are a number of issues worthy of discussion in any given week in our country. I want to begin by extending good evening greetings and good night greetings to all of you who are joining me on television from Mahaika to West Coast Barbies in Region 5 and Region 6 along the east bank of the Barbies River, New Amsterdam, Kanji, Lower and Upper Quarantine Coast, all the way to Crabwood Creek and Molson Creek. All of you who are joining me on television, good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. To our friends who are joining us on Freedom Radio from Rob Street, Georgetown, good evening and welcome to another program of Issues in the News. And last but not least, to the tens of thousands of you who are joining us on Facebook Live right across the length and breadth of Guyana, the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and as far as Australia on this Facebook Live. Good evening and welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. Please share this live feed, press that share button on your phone, press that share button on your computers so that you and your friends and followers can join us in creating the widest possible audience. Mark Wilson, Ravindra Mohan, Bobby Budram, Santi Sivsankar, Arjun Jawahir, Navi Chand, um, Ravi Jai Chan, Robert Rampasad, Omar Mohabir, Chandar from Canada, Jasmine Ramdat, Musa Ramdas, Saltfish, <laughs> um, Kayum Yasin, Chitra Sukraj, Soma Bipath, Horace Sankar, and so many of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. Please press that share button so that this program is shared with your friends and with your followers right across the Facebook landscape so that we can have the widest cross-section of viewers and listeners joining us in today's program. I want to begin by saluting His Excellency President Dr. Mohammed Irfan Ali, for launching yet another innovative initiative called Men on Mission. I was proud to be part of the launch of this initiative and I was astonished at the number of persons who became part of the launch. I was part of the organizing committee and played a very small role in organizing what turned out to be a massive and mammoth event, bringing together nearly 5,000 men across the length and breadth of Guyana, across ethnic divide, across political divide, coming together under one umbrella of improving the lives and livelihood of men in our country. This is an initiative that is not intended or designed to undermine the role that women have been playing in our country. We respect the role that women have been playing. We salute our women folk for their accomplishments. We salute them for being in the lead in many of the sectors of our country, in being in the lead in many of our professional pursuits, in being in the lead in terms of student population at many of our professional learning institutions, including 
our university, the University of Guyana, and we salute them for working and operating under very adverse circumstances. And we salute them for those accomplishments, achievements, and leadership status which they have worked hard to achieve and have achieved in large number across the national spectrum of our country. However, we believe that the, our male counterparts, we believe our men are falling back and we believe that in bringing our two genders together, in advancing in one unison, we need to also pay attention to our men folk in our society. They, are, they, they have slipped recognizable, recognizably in many respects. And this initiative is simply to sensitize, to bring awareness, and where possible, to build collaborative relationships of a constructive nature that can see not only our men and boy folks moving forward, assuming their traditional and conventional role as leaders of society, but must at the same time join hands with our women folk to take the full mantle of leadership in every respect of human endeavors across the length and breadth of our country. We believe that our men folks are falling prey to domestic violence. They are falling prey to drugs. They are falling prey to alcoholism. They are falling prey to anger. They are falling prey to joblessness. They are falling prey to many of the ills that we are seeing manifesting in our society. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with an initiative that is designed, intended, and engineered to bring them back to a state of acuteness and a state of awareness, to make them and to remind them and to make them once again cognizant of their role and responsibilities in society as fathers, as brothers, as sons, as the molders and shapers of the destiny of our country. And this initiative was simply to put that into perspective and to highlight those failings of our men and appeal to them to correct those failings and to work with them where possible to bridge the gaps and to correct where we find there are space for correction. The success of any initiative of this government, in my view, is measured by the opposition's response. We have an opposition that is incapable of joining hands with the government or with any progressive force in this country on any matter of a beneficial nature. We have an opposition that is incapable of extending an, a hand in any engagement of a constructive nature. We have an opposition that is incapable of the magnanimity of recognizing when an idea is good and to put personal, political, and insular differences aside and to embrace a good initiative. They are incapable of doing that. So when they see a good initiative, they can, one does not have always to criticize one's opponent. One can recognize the good in one's opponent, commend it, join hands with it, but remain focused in your initiative or in your peculiar role as an opposition. Nobody is asking you to capitulate. Nobody is asking you to abandon your cause or your focus or your objective of your, or your political role. 
all we are saying that when there is a good initiative, there is nothing wrong. In fact, there is everything right in embracing that initiative and joining hands with it. Because Guyana and Guyanese are one. And when we are facing a problem as a collective, that problem doesn't, is not directed to one segment of our country. Alcoholism, drug abuse, domestic violence, and ills that are peculiarly Guyanese, well, not peculiarly Guyanese, but are pervading in our society, do not, or do not afflict one segment of our population, but it goes across political borders. And if there is an initiative that can address any of these societal ills, then true leaders must be able to rise above narrow differences, must be able to rise above political partisanship and embrace each other on these national initiatives, things that are in the best interest of Guyana. And this is an initiative of that type which the opposition has lost the opportunity to or rather are incapable of recognizing or appreciating this opportunity for collabor collaboration. Instead, one long diatribe after another in criticizing the initiative and trying to deny great members of the government, male members of the government. They have issued respective statements, one from the AFC, one from the APNU, trying to demonize the men in our government, trying to demonize the men in our society simply because of this initiative. They can't equal it. They certainly can't surpass it. They are incapable of conceiving one of their own. But rather than rise to the occasion, don't necessarily compliment the president. Don't compliment the government. You don't have to do that. We don't need your compliment. But look and see that 5,000 Guyanese men, many may have voted for you, coming together to express their support. Are you not seeing that you are becoming quickly an irrelevant force, an, ir an irrelevant grouping that is growing smaller and smaller, that the population is moving on? The population is identifying with issues that are beneficial for their social advancement, for their economic upliftment, for the advancement of themselves and their families. And you are becoming more and more of a relic of something of the past. And that is where we are taking this country. And that is where the country is moving with a government. But we have repeatedly said that in our initiatives, there is a place for every single Guyanese. And we welcome all on board. What we will not do and what we will not countenance is a group of people who will want to hold the progress back who will want to reverse the advancements that we are making. They are not coming on board with a one Guyana agenda. But the one Guyana agenda is developing momentum every single day, despite their Herculean efforts to undermine it, to criticize it, to destabilize it, but we are moving forward and the country is moving forward with us. As I said, if you want to measure any policy, program, or initiative of our government, just listen or look at the reaction of the opposition. The greater the reaction, the more successful is the initiative, program, or policy. And that is my measuring rod. 
and from their reaction, quite apart from the event itself, which by its large numbers that it generated at Camp Ayangana, the response from the opposition was so acid that it led me to conclude that it was a very, very successful initiative. And what we saw there is only the launch. It is only the initiation. The program will now unfold and will invigorate every corner of the society, every community in the society, every village, every tongue, every municipality, every dam, every hill, and every mountain in this country. That is what we intend to do. So opposition, you have a long and tired road to travel. The second issue that I want to speak about is the public consultations which we held on electoral reforms at the Arthur Chung Conference Center last Tuesday. That also was an initiative that was successful, that was a learning experience for those who attended based upon the feedback which we received, that it was viewed on Facebook by tens of thousands of you who have offered your comments, your compliments, and your congratulations alike. Many people have spoken with me and have messaged me to say how much they have learned from the process. It was a public consultation on a matter of national importance. We are sometimes accused of not consulting and here it was that we had an event that lasted from 1 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., five and a half hours long. Stream live on the crucial concept of our electoral system and the reforms which we are making to the process. This was the second incarnation of consultation with members of the public and interested civil society organizations. The first one, the parliamentary opposition parties choose not to participate. In the second round of the consultation, they chose to participate. They wrote Ms. Gail Teixeira and indicated, I think, that Roysdale Ford from APNU will attend and Kemraj Ramjatan from AFC will attend. I saw both gentlemen in the audience and the courteous person that I am, I recognized their presence. Lo and behold, within 45 minutes or less of the program starting, the two gentlemen walked out, abandoning their party, abandoning their mandate, and abandoning their responsibilities. They went back to their principles and apparently reported that Gail Teixeira and I were monopolizing the event. Well, the event lasted for five and a half hours. I spoke for about an hour and Gail Teixeira spoke 
for about 10 to 15 minutes. So 45 minutes or to an hour I spoke and Gail Tishere, I believe, spoke for about 15 minutes in a five and a half hour marathon session. But these guys do not want to work. I don't think that they may, I don't think that they read the bills. They don't want to work. They don't want to do the, the people's work. Or they are so arrogant that they believe that once they are present, they must be afforded some special opportunity or be offered some special treatment. Well, I'm sorry, we don't operate like that. You are part of the audience like everyone else. I give you your recognition as members of parliament and you are to participate like the rest of the participants. They choose not to do so and they left. Then they had press conferences condemning the exercise and talking about list bloated and talking about what must be done to clean the list. When there was an opportunity presented to them where they could have presented a case for the public to see or for the public to hear about what their concerns are and to engage the government directly and possibly embarrass the government because they have a better case or embarrass the government because their arguments are more compelling or put their proposals there for the public to see how attractive their proposals are and that the government is ignoring it. They did none of that. They sat and they walked out after 40 to 45 minutes. They can't, they don't have the discipline. I don't think they did any work. I don't think they have any ideas to offer. I don't think they had any recommendations to make. And I believe rather than embarrass themselves, having regard to the fact that the program was being streamed live and you had a hundred or more persons representing different organizations in the country, rather than expose themselves to the risk or risks of a public embarrassment, they decided to leave and as usual from different Zoom platforms where they are sitting by themselves cuts down the government for not offering them an opportunity to participate. So Norton had a press conference today in which he did exactly that. Speak critically of the exercise and explaining that his people had to leave because Kail Tishir and I were monopolizing the event. A hundred other persons were part of that exercise. They didn't leave. But the two parliamentary opposition who are actually being paid, who are actually being paid to do parliamentary work, they decide that they are not going to stay. But they are receiving taxpayers' money and they have nothing to show for what their contribution is to the electoral reforms. That is the type of opposition that you have. Absolutely incompetent, absolutely derelict in terms of their responsibility, and absolutely arrogant in their outlook. Up to now, let us assume even to save face, even to save face, I said from the floor that they can put, anyone can send recommendations and proposals in writing. Are you telling me that not one recommendation, they can't write a line, even to save face, even to say 
even to say to the public, look, we are putting 10 recommendations to them. And they are ignoring us. They have not put one single amendment forward. Not one. But that is how they were in government. They are completely, completely incompetent. But they like to they like talk, talk. Sound bites that you all... Uh, 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 the list needs to be clean. The list needs to be... Well, tell us how to clean the list. Alexander went there as a representative of it, it, it Padaji and telling me about recommendations how to remove dead people from the list other than... Well, he's not telling me, but he's asking me for recommendations. Other than the registrar of deaths passing a list over of the dead people to the registration, to the GCOM, for the GCOM to take those dead people names off the list, Mr. Alexander is asking me to come up with recommendations outside of that process to deal with unregistered debts. And I had to ask him a magnificent question. I said, Mr. Alexander, I don't know. You have been paid for 20 years. You're working at GCOM. You can't come up with one recommendation. This is my own. Tell me what you have. What are you recommending, having sitting at GCOM for 20 years as a commissioner? You have a responsibility to clean, clean the list. You're collecting a salary for 20 odd years. You're the most senior GCOM commissioner and you can't come up with one recommendation how to clean the list? And you want me to find recommendations? Well, I have found, quite apart from criticizing my own, tell me what you have found. No, they can't come up with one. They are devoid of ideas. But they can talk and they can criticize. That's all that they can do. But ask them to get something done. Ask them to do something of their own. They can't. And that's why they're out of government. They did nothing for five years in government. But that's a whole different story. So let's see what the views are. I thought I will speak about the consultations quickly so that we can move on. So remember, share the program, share the live feed, press the share button on your phone, on your computers, so that more and more of your friends and followers can join us in this important discussion. So the other important item that made the news, which I wish to comment on, is the unfortunate detention of Miss Tamika Clark, an attorney at law who apparently was at the Special Organized Crime Unit to represent a person who was assisting with ongoing investigations. The person was not, as I understand it, a suspect. The person was assisting with the investigations. I was called, as I said in a video, by Sean Alicock, a lawyer with whom Ms. Clark works, and he informed me of the incident, and I immediately intervened. And what I said is already on video, which I've disseminated. But a press conference was held where no mention at all, I believe, was made of my intervention. But I did what I had to do, and I spoke with the young lady myself, and I apologized to her. I see a criticism coming from some quarters to say that my intervention constituted interference, that it constituted an improper 
political intrusion. Let me say for the record that I reject those accusations and insinuations unreservedly. Let me also mention that if I did not intervene when asked to do so, I would have been damned. I intervened and I am still damned. The accusations say that I stopped a charge from being instituted, that I instructed the police. I did none of those things. The Attorney General is the legal representative of the Guyana Police Force and indeed the legal representative of many state organs and of course the government of Guyana under different pieces of legislation and even under the Constitution. I am also part of my function is to ensure that the Constitution is being upheld. And when the Constitution is allegedly being violated, I am the named defendant. Having regard, and also, I, as the defendant, I have to defend alleged violations of the law by these agencies and alleged violations of the Constitution. When I am unable to successfully do that, taxpayers' dollars have to be used to pay compensation. Part of my responsibility, therefore, professional and fiduciary and constitutional, constitutional and legal, touch and concern the protection of the public purse against compensation being awarded. So is it that I must stand idly by from that perspective and having regard to my role, which I have outlined, I must stand idly by and allow without intervention these transgressions to take place and then have to be called upon to defend them when sometimes the damage is already done and the defense is indefensible and also a wait for the public, to the public treasury to fund compensation emanating from these excesses. Is that my role, that I am robotic? I never instruct or directed any police. I advised, and the video is there uned unedited. I advised the police. I advised the police. I used that word about four times in the video. Not direct. Direction is what Kemraj Ramjatan did to seal Al Pasad when he sent him on leave. Kemrad Ramjatan wrote Silal Prasad a letter which was made public saying to Silal Prasad that the president is directing him through Ramjatan to go on pre-retirement leave. That is a direction and that, I believe, is unlawful and that constitutes interference. A direction is what Joe Harmon did in a letter in which he says that he's acting upon the instruction of the president directing the police service commission to halt promotions. That is a direction of an improper nature. And I have a judgment to that effect in relation to that direction. 
It was unlawful and unconstitutional. A direction also is what Simona Brooms did as a minister to the Public Service Commission by instructing them to halt promotions again. I have another judgment from a court pronouncing that that is unlawful and that is unconstitutional. That, my friend, or my friends, is what constitutes unlawful direction, unlawful interference, and political interference. Not what I did. And if I have to do it all over again, I will do it, because I consider it as part of my duty. The other issue that I want to speak about is to update you on the construct, well, the establishment of a Council of Legal Education Law School in Guyana. As you know, at its last meeting held in Barbados earlier this year, the Council of Legal Education has expressed its willingness to receive from Guyana a proposal for the establishment of a law school. Last week, cabinet approved a decision that the government of Guyana will proceed to satisfy the criteria and to do a feasibility study as recommended by the Council of Legal Education in respect of the establishment of a local law school or a law school within territorial Guyana to be operated under the auspices of the Council of Legal Education. So a team will soon be assembled to begin work on this very important initiative. I will update you as that team begins its work. A lot of people are asking me to comment on the New York political activity which occurred over the weekend. The government of Guyana has already issued a statement, and of course, I stand by that statement. The thing is that what is worrying is that, first of all, serious allegations are made against the government or were made against the government at that forum. Racism was alleged against the government of Guyana. Racism is a constitutional wrong under the constitution of our country. And it's not the first time, obviously, that these allegations have been made. The government of Guyana enjoys good relationship with the government of the United States. Elected officials are at these engagements and elected officials were at the last engagement. And they seem to come to conclusions and draw adverse inferences at these engagements and make public statements of an adverse nature 
as a result of what they are told by those who speak there. And those who speak there are known opponents of the government and have serious differences with the government. My problem is that these elected officials are arriving at these conclusions, are drawing these adverse inferences, are making these adverse statements about the government of a sovereign nation without at all attempting to verify the veracity of what is being said, to verify the authenticity of what is being said. They are not attempting to engage the government for a response, but come to these conclusions, violating in that the process every known doctrine of fairness, of due process, and condemning an entire country and its people. Something is fundamentally wrong with that, in my humble view. The last time this occurred, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Sam Hines, who is our ambassador to the United States, attempted to engage with certain elected officials who were present at one of those engagements and who made similar critical statements, and that elected official refused to engage the Prime Minister, the ambassador. Now it is happening again. The government, I have no doubt, will speak out on this matter in greater details. Speaking for myself, we have to understand that the person who is engineering, or one of the main persons engineering this, is trying to build a support base for himself because he is under investigation and legal processes will flow. And he is trying to build a, some type of support mechanism. The law is not an ass. And any intelligent person will be able to see through the facade. This person is engaged in all type of extortionist schemes and other illegal engagements. And he knows that his activity, activities, are under scrutiny and investigation and that actions are going to be taken. And he is manipulating a whole grouping around, of people around him. The law allows everyone a long rope to graze. He will continue to attack me and far better than him have tried to denigrate me, to attack me, and they have not succeeded, and, and he <laughs> will not. But a group of lawyers from the Caribbean have approached me, and they have, they're concerned with the things that he is saying, and I ask them to look at it and to recommend, make recommendations to me, and they are doing that right now, and I will take my own set of actions if I decide to go 
in that direction. The thing is that these people sometimes are not worth it. And you take actions against them and you give them recognition. Because without you, they have nothing. He will latch on to this program and he will use this now and respond for a whole nother month to give himself relevance. That is how they exist. And they accuse. You know, when I listen to the, 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 this allegation of racism and the disrespect that they have for the people of Guyana, including afro guyanese it is unbelievable. And I hope that afro guyanese I hope that indo guyanese I hope that portuguese guyanese I hope that chinese guyanese I hope that dogla guyanese and Amerindian guyanese are listening to these people and are listening to the disrespect that these people view them with. Imagine we have a cabinet comprising of Mark Phillips as Prime Minister, a man who spent his entire life in the army. He's the Prime Minister of this country. Ropes and Ben, a man who is a home affairs minister. Utah, foreign affairs minister. One Agil, public works infrastructure minister. Onej Waldron, minister of business, tourism and commerce. Joseph Hamilton, Minister of Labor. Kwame McCoy, Minister with responsibility within the office of the Prime Minister. All these people are in the cabinet of our government, holding some of the most powerful positions. And according to these, this, these few in New York, these people here, the same brothers that I've mentioned, they have no value. According to them, they are house slaves. These people who are performing these powerful portfolio responsibilities within the state and government structure of Guyana are worthless in the eyes of those people. The chancellor of the judiciary, the chief justice of the country, The Registrar of the Supreme Court, the Chief Magistrate, Senior Magistrate, Principal Magistrate, Commissioner of Police, Head of the Army, Head of the Prison Service, Head of the Guyana Revenue Authority, the, the leading revenue collection agency. And I'm just mentioning a, two, a couple that comes to mind. 60% of the permanent secretaries within this government are all afro guyanese All those people that I called are all afro guyanese And to this grouping, this motley crew, this crew of extremists, these people, I don't know what they're calling them, that these people are sitting down as part of a government that is racist against afro guyanese And when these people speak, this grouping, no other race matters in this country. I have no place in this land where I was born. Amerindians have no place. Portuguese have no place. Mixed people apparently have no place. All these Afro-Guyanese that I've mentioned 
and the tens of thousands who are supportive of the People's Progressive Party have no place in Guyana. Guyana was made only for this couple in, in Brooklyn. And these elected officials of America are listening to that one-sided bile and diatribe and are condemning our government and our country without hearing a word from us. I don't know in what part of the world is that acceptable democracy. I don't know which public official worth let me don't commit the same mistake but it must you must question what principles are these people governed by where you can condemn an entire government of a sovereign nation With whom your country shares good relations without affording them an opportunity to be heard, without trying to hear their side. And when they try to make contact with you, you blank them. And in this equation, let me remind that Guyana's ambassador to the United States. Samuel Anthony Archibald Hines, afro guyanese the consular officer who was recently appointed to New York, afro guyanese These people don't matter. These people are decorations. Is it how they see their fellow afro guyanese That is how they denigrate their own afro guyanese and they got people like Paul Slow who attempted to stop the promotion of hundreds of Afro Guyanese in the police force. And that is why the cases are going on. Paul Slow didn't tell them that. Paul Slow wanted to promote his two or three people while at the same time frustrating and refusing to promote. Hundreds of Afro Guyanese in the force. And when he didn't get his way, he ran to court for orders to block promotions. And these are the guys who are going out there to masquerade as defenders of Afro Guyanese. It's a pity that I'm coming to program time now because I can speak another hour. On these issues, these pretenders who are representing Afro Guyanese and who have done nothing substantial for Afro Guyanese, in fact, have done nothing for any grouping of Guyanese in this country. None. They have a track record of no accomplishment. What the group in New York ever did for anybody in this country? Those are haters of progress. They are haters of the People's Progressive Party. I don't know why. I don't know why. But hate has never killed. Hate has never stopped progress. Every day our government will continue to work to build one Guyana. And that is why I keep saying to people that the PPP, the party of Cherry Jagan, has a different role to play. We can't afford to descend in the gutter every time they descend. If Jagan had done what Burnham did, where Guyana would have been today, Jagan took the high road and led this country from the dungeons of the opposition when Bonham was raping the country and rigging elections. Jagan never resorted to armed struggle, never went and played that racial card that so many people wanted him to play. And that is the role that the PPP will continue to have to play or else this country will implode. We can't afford 
to engage these racists and these extremists. We have to always keep our attention focused on the big picture, on what is best for our country and all of our people. And that is what we are committed to as a government and as a political party. So, my friends, I know that sometimes you get angry, you get frustrated because we are not replying with the same type of aggression. You have to understand that we are not the same. And if we are to travel that road, that they want us to travel. These are people who have achieved nothing in life, in their personal life, or in any other endeavor. They have achieved nothing. They live their life on hate, on enmity, on anger, on bitterness, on jealousy, on envy. They are unhappy people. They are an unhappy bunch of non-accomplishers. We have a country to build. If we dedicate our, if we em, try to emulate them, you end up like them. We have to travel a road. We have to move this country forward. We have children. Our country's children's future are in our hands. Our children's future generations are in our hands. This country future are in our we can't afford to respond with the same poison. We can't. We are not made from that. We are not, we are cut from a different cloth. And I say that to you to manage your expectations. You yourself, successful people, will know that you are successful because you didn't bother with those who wanted to distract you. Many, as you chart your road to success, there were many persons who would have wanted to engage you to take you away from your path to success. Many would have tried to do that. Some of them were even your, maybe your friends who wanted to distract you. You became successful because you were focused and because you had an objective and that you had a dream. We have that dream. We have that objective. We have that vision. And we have made a promise to deliver on that vision and on that dream. So my brothers and sisters, don't be too agitated. Look at these people. Listen to them if you wish. I don't listen to them. Most of the times, only when people send videos to me or send some screenshot of something, then I pay some attention to what goes on there. But that is not our agenda. But we still have to defend our government. We have to defend the nation, state of Guyana. And these people can't be allowed to tarnish the good image of our country the good image of Guyana, the good image of our government. We will not allow that to happen. So rest assured, things are going to happen. Investigations are continuing. And the law, I have trust in the law. I have belief in the law. The law shall prevail in the end, my friends. The law shall prevail in the end. Thank you very much for being part of this program with me for the past 55 minutes or an hour. It has been a pleasure once again to speak with you and join me next week as we continue with another program of issues in the news. I hope that I have been able to clarify some of the issues that were occupying your minds and I hope that I've engaged you in a meaningful discourse. Please take care of yourself 
and join me next week. Until then, enjoy and be safe. Thank you very much and may God bless you. Thank you.